Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing, a no-hype, mission-focused channel trying to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. Today, I'm struggling with this one, folks, because we are looking at a high-growth, cheap stock making money. Whoa, what? In, in a frothy market like this, you can find cheap, high growth and, and profitable? Is I, I didn't even know that still existed outside of a select few companies. I mean, this, this I'm, I'm a little flabbergasted in all honesty looking at it. Now, as I look at the business model, they're clearly Pubmatic is the stock that we're looking at. P-U-B-M is the ticker. And so I, I like the initial look that I'm seeing. I like the fact that they're tapping into some secular tailwinds that could drive long-term growth. But I do have a lot of concerns sort of that about potential blow-up risks or about competitive dynamics. We'll talk about that later in this video. That said, overall, I find this company and the setup to be very interesting. It looks like a company riding a favorable secular tailwind with a favorable valuation. And, and I don't have to do, you know, Herculean assumptions about, oh, what, what could this business look like in the future regarding their profit margins? This is a business generating profit, juicy profit margins now. So there's a lot that I like as I look at Pubmatic. Let's dive in right now so that way you could understand what is PUBM stock and what are they up to. And so as we look at it, one should first understand this is not my first run-in with ad tech space. I'd previously done a video on the Trade Desk and I personally owned the Trade Desk for a little under four years. It's been a 15X investment for myself. So I am personally very interested in learning more about the ad tech space given the fact that this is a juicy environment. There's a lot of very successful companies in this space riding this secular tailwind of effectively more and more advertising going from manual to programmatic or going you know from man manual to digital now to take a step back what what's what's pubmatic doing so to understand is that they are effectively a supply side platform and that's where they stand here the sell side platform where they represent the publishers and the app developers the ones that have effectively space where they're looking to say hey we we have this space we want an advertiser to be on this space we want effectively to get ad revenue from the space we have on our site so the sell side platform connects with the demand side platform or the dsp and the demand side platform represents the advertisers the ones that are going to spend money and they, the advertisers, usually hire agencies that represent the advertisers. So here it is. These two are represented by the DSPs or the demand side platforms, which interact with the sell side platforms to say, hey, what's a good bid for this space on this publisher's website, for this app, for this screenshot, or whatever it is, let's figure out, or for, for some you know, over-the-top television or connected TV, what is this little clip of time worth and that's this sort of battle that goes on between the sell side platform and the demand side platform trying to figure out how much is this worth at auction and this is a secular shift from manual to digital to programmatic advertising generating tons and tons of data check out that trade desk video if you're interested in in full disclosure i still own trade desk stock and i also own, own google stock and this is just you know, and I, I don't at this at the time of this you know publication, I do not own any Pubmatic stock, but that's part of the reason why I'm making this. I want to hear your feedback. We'll talk more about that a little later. But what you're looking at here is just the incredible creation of content. Here it is: 211 billion ad impressions per day, one trillion advertiser bids per day. I mean, this is just this is a huge development, a huge amount of data that needs to get processed to run all this sort of real-time advertising to say, hey. How much are these impressions worth? And part of the revolution has occurred just in the last few years with header bidding, where publishers and ad inventory can effectively stall select software that now enables header bidding, which is, in, in summary, a single parallel auction. So you're not just working with one supply side platform, you're working with multiples at the same time that can all run a auction at the same time for the same advertisement. This drives increased transparency, greater demand because you're able to spread it out across more, you know, sell side platforms and higher publishing revenue. So this this strikes them, the publisher wins because they're they're able to get, hey, better better returns for what the space that they have, better ad revenue, better growth for them. 
And as you dig into Pubmatic and you look at what they're doing, they represent a lot of media, you know, from from DraftKings to, you know, ABC, you know, and keep in mind, it's it's it, it's not necessarily everything. It's not like an exclusive relationship, but it's saying, hey, we have represented some of the properties, let's say, for Unity or Verizon and Verizon, you know, acquired part of Yahoo. And that that represents Verizon Media Group represents about 20 percent of Pubmatic sales. So that is a red flag. We'll talk more about that later. But broadly, you're looking at, you know, 1,200 publishers that represent 80,000 domains and apps. So this is a lot of different space, whether or not it's Zillow or Zynga, a lot of different ad space here that, that desires to get filled. eBay, a lot of brand, big brand name uh, recognition here. But I do have some concerns about this and what, what, you know, is this actually first tier or second tier content? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, are they unrivaled? And regular viewers of this channel know that is the framework that I look at all companies as this rivaled, unrivaled sort of binary question easily filters out 90% plus of the companies out there. And the reason why it's so important is because fundamentals drive the long-term returns of, of the stocks that people own over multi, over years, decade perspective, is it's the fundamentals. And fundamentals, it's easier for companies to grow if they're unrivaled, if they're not competing with someone else. And the easiest way to think about it is if you're unrivaled, you could, let's say, raise prices every year because you're unrivaled. It means you have this, this option to grow faster than, let's say, you were in cutthroat competition. You're in the trenches with someone else. You don't have room. You know, if, you, if you're in the trenches trying to fight someone else, you're not going to be able to easily make a lot of progress. You're not going to be able to say, hey, you know, what? We're, we're just raising prices 5%. You have to check, oh, what's the competition doing? So I love to see, are you unrivaled? Are you rivaled? And that, that does play a key aspect in my own personal investment journey. If you're interested in learning about my investment journey, go to unraveledinvesting.com. But that's also the reason why I came up with the name of this channel is Unrivaled Investing is because I want to look at everything through that framework. It makes it easier in my mind to see, will this be a successful investment potentially over time? And so are they unrivaled? And honestly, nope. You know, if you, if you just even do a quick search for the top 10, let's say supply side platforms, in the ad tech space, they barely show up as a contender, as a top player when you look at it. And you know, the Google ad manager, that is by far one of the bigger players. And you got a lot of other companies out there that compete with them. Even in even in Pubmatic's uh, annual report, they talk about competing with Magnite. And so they compete with a lot of different players that are bigger than them. And so that is a little bit of a red flag. That, that, that is a big red flag to me as an investor, because I want to find things that have unfair fights that have this, this, they're just going to crush it for some reason or another. That said, this is where the weird signals start coming in. And I'd love the feedback that you have definitely in the comments where interestingly, they grew 30% in 2020, 63% in the fourth quarter of 2020. So this is the biggest quarter is the holiday season, fourth quarter. And those those growth rates are above average for the industry. This is this this means they're taking market share. And then as you look at 2021, they've raised their guidance from 21 to 24% to 31 to 34%, nearly 200 million in revenue. And once again, effectively, much faster than the underlying industry. I mean, the industry maybe is growing, you know, first of all, ad spend is growing single digits. Digital ad spend is growing, let's say, 10 to 15% a year. So if you're growing 30%, you're growing potentially multiples of what the underlying industry is. So I'm. it makes me wonder, like, wait a second, are you doing something special? Like, why are you growing faster than the industry, especially when I see here that you're not unrivaled that you have lots of competition why what is this a new development is there something going on and you know so one angle that of, of why they could potentially be taking share now is how they talk about an infrastructure first approach and how they have the lowest cost infrastructure of any specialized cloud infrastructure platform in the advertising market where they we own and operate our proprietary software and hardware infrastructure around the world this approach saves significant costs compared to companies that rely on public cloud alternatives due to the data intensive nature of digital advertising and the immense volume of ad impressions created by header bidding. This is really interesting. So they're effectively saying, oh yeah, those cloud, you know, public clouds that, that folks are using, whether or not it's Amazon, Google, you know, Microsoft Azure. If you're, let's say a sell side, a supply side platform using a public cloud, 
you might be at a cost disadvantage relative to them as they've built out their own they've built out their own infrastructure that factors in not only you know the hardware but the software as well and and they they effectively make this point elsewhere which is if you're using the public cloud you can manipulate the software but you can't manipulate the hardware and that might be an advantage for them they continue, since our inception, we have built and constantly improved upon our infrastructure, and in turn, we have developed a deep expertise in continuously optimizing and growing it. As a result, our cost of revenue per impression proceeded process decreased by 32% in 2020 compared to 2019 and decreased by 18% in 2019 compared to 2018. So the cost of revenue per impression, and keep in mind, this is a, this is a really important figure because this is they're constantly showing impressions. This is a supply side platform. They're showing, you know, literally millions, billions of impressions. And that was, you know, I, the initial data that I was showing at the beginning and every day. And that costs a lot of electricity that takes a lot of energy. And so here it is, they're saying, yeah, we're able to figure out ways to lower that cost of impression. And we believe that capital and efficiency and operating expertise requirements that we possess present a significant barrier to entry. So the, those two key phrases like lower cost than the public cloud, barrier to entry, those smell interesting to me. That smells like you might be doing something that sets you apart from the rest of the competitive industry, from the rest of your competitors. Maybe you're starting to do something unrivaled and that's the reason why you're starting to take share. And I want to learn more about that. I, I, once again, I'm asking you if you have an angle or perspective on that, love to hear the comments there. And so then what about valuation? And here I'm going to do a quick plug where once again, if this is your first time tuning in, my name is Daniel. If you enjoy learning about potential multi-baggers, types of stocks that potentially go up hundreds or thousands of percent over time, please make a point of subscribing or hurting, hitting that thumbs up. If you want to follow my personal journey as I try to buy these potential multi-baggers for myself, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Each week I do weekly updates. What am I buying and selling thoughts on the market? I also do first week of the month. I call out my full portfolio in detail, top holdings. And then once a month, I call out a potential potential multi-bag or types of stock that I think does have attractive risk reward, asymmetric risk reward. And so that is the quick plug for unrivaledinvesting.com. Let's get back into Pubmatic P-U-B-M stock where what I'm trying to understand is, you know, clearly not unrivaled, but what's that valuation now? Because they maybe are doing stuff that's special as they're taking market share. And so as I look at it, you're looking at 30% plus growth recently you know, even like 60% plus in the fourth quarter and juicy, juicy margins, you know, like gross margins of greater than 70% profit margins. So operating profit margins. So that's, this is after depreciation of 20% plus. So I'm thinking, man, even at scale, this could be even higher. The fact that they're profitable now, it makes them stand out in a, in a world where, you know, growth is is getting a hyper premium valuation, even if it's unprofitable. And as I look at this, you know, the reality is this this is a very reasonable valuation relative to what you see elsewhere. I mean, this is a company growing at 30% trading at eight times sales. And that is an interesting framework. I mean, looking for companies trading under 10 times sales at with good growth rates in the years ahead strikes me as compelling. And so as I look at this framework that you, that that you know broadly speaking, you know, it's currently around 1.6 billion dollar market cap, growing, you know, maybe somewhere between 30 and 40% this next year, has operating profit margin somewhere between 20 and 30%, slap on a tax rate, you know, on a pro forma basis trade somewhere between let's say 34 and 55 times, which is in the realm of very reasonable for a company that might be growing 30 to 40% this next year. What's the growth rate in the ensuing years ahead? Then that, that it gets back to the, are you unrivaled or are you doing something special in the years ahead? Because if the underlying industry, let's say continues to grow at 10 to 15% a year, I'm talking about digital and programmatic and they capture a disproportionate share because they're doing something special, you know, maybe you grow double that or maybe you grow, you know, slightly less or, you know, slightly more than double. And so I, I think of a range over the ensuing five years beyond this next year of 25 to 35% annualized growth from here. And so then the question is, well, what's the multiple that you want to assume five years out for those earnings, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 times. It's a question mark for what 
what you want to think about that could be worth. And either way, just applying this hypothetical framework does get you to effectively break even over the next five years and nearly 200% upside. So that is the type of asymmetric risk reward that I like to see. And of course, this is a hypothetical valuation framework. Things can play out very differently from here. I mean, look, if you have a recession, depression, ad spend will drop like a rock and these companies will get hit hard. That said, right now, there's no, you know, you're not really seeing signs of, of that playing out. And, you know, you can certainly look at other ad tech players that trade at multiples way higher than this. So I, I like the setup. I like the valuation. I like what they're doing, but I do have some concerns. And that's the reason why I haven't pulled the trigger yet for my own personal journey. And I'm very curious to hear your thoughts as well on it. Um, so what are some of the concerns that, that have got me so far? Well, one is you do have this sort of fragility as you look at it, where this customer concentration risk, as you look at Verizon, with effectively 20 to 30% of their revenue in effectively contracts with Verizon. It's one of your contracts that have 30 day termination notice. So this, that's business that, that effectively can leave if they're not happy with them in the future. And that, that's, that's a material part of their business. You wouldn't want to lose, you know, one fifth of your body weight in, in one year, you know, unless you're, you know, looking to lose the weight. You know, if, if you're a healthy person, you don't want to lose one fifth in a, in a day. That would be real problems or one fifth in a month. And then another red flag or concern for me was seeing the co-founder, one of the, the brothers, Amar Goel, the, 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 this company was founded by two brothers, and he's currently the board, member of the board of directors and chairman, and he serves as the chief innovation officer. Now that's different from chief technology officer, this is innovation officer. And I, I wonder, is this sort of a phony baloney title? Is this a legit title with a lot of responsibility? Is this just the founder trying to stay involved without having to be super duper, you know, in the in the weeds? I'm thinking, look, ad tech space is rapidly evolving. A lot of competitors see it's a, you know, a, a field where the prize is literally tens of billions of dollars in ad spend. So there's going to be a lot of innovation, not only in the past, but in the future. And having a someone that's really focused full time on this is important. And yet here it is, this co-founder, he currently works for the company on a part time basis. So that does rub me the wrong way that it's like, wait a second, if you're going to be one of the top dogs, you need to be focused, you know, 110 uh, percent. And so that that is a little bit of a concern for me as I think about that. I mean, the 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 the, the revenue concentration is a bigger concern for me. And then the other aspects is one is it's around 200 million in revenue that they're guiding to this year, but they've been around since around 2008. So like, how come it's taken them so long to get to 200 million in revenue? I mean, look, don't get me wrong. It's not like I've, you know, I, I've created a business with 200 million in revenue. I, I haven't. Um, but you do see a lot of companies that have been around for a lot less time, get a lot bigger scale in less time. And so it makes me wonder, is this just a function of too much competition? And you sort of see that thesis played out of too much competition, as in 2019, they only grew by 15%, which was significantly lower than other ad tech players like Trade Desk and Google. So it does make me wonder, you know, what's what's going on in this space? Is there just too much competition? Um, you know, is the benefit that they've had in the last few quarters sort of been a one-off? Is 2020 one-off? Should we expect continued, you know, market share grab in the years ahead? And management thinks they can do it, but it's unclear to me really what's going to set them apart, especially when this space definitely seems competitive. Um, now, if you're interested in, once again, unrivaled investing and the potential multi-baggers I call out, it is interesting to note that in July, I called out a potential multi-bagger that's growing at like 70 to 80 percent and trades at like three to four times sales. And so here it is. You have a company that's growing at like 30 to 40 percent and trades at eight times sales. And still, I think this company is pretty, you know, pretty cheap. I, I have concerns about the business model, the management, some risks longer term, like Verizon, 20% of revenue walking out the door. But you, you know, the, the reality is there are other potential multi-baggers out there. If you're interested in seeing, you know, the ones that I've called out, I called out a company trading below liquidation value that could potentially be worth two to three X over time. I called that out a few months ago. So that's at unrivaledinvesting.com. If you enjoyed this video on Pubmatic, P-U-B-M stock, please make a point of subscribing. If you're already a subscriber, I do appreciate that thumbs up. Thanks so much for watching.